Tonight, we are learning more about the techniques that divers have used to recover the victims of the deadly Coeur d'Alene plane crash. Plus, the Idaho Department of Education released their plans today to get students back at school this fall. We answer your questions tonight. Tracking a chance of a few showers this evening, then sunshine and very warm weather all in your forecast next. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm Whitney Ward. Welcome, everyone. I'm Mark Hanrahan. Rescue crews found the last two victims of Sunday's deadly mid-air collision above Lake Coeur d'Alene. Divers removed one of the bodies last night, and the final remaining victim was found inside the wreckage and will be recovered when the plane is removed from the water. Krem 2's Taylor Vido has been following this story all week and explains the process has been grueling. So there's a lot of debris in the, in the lake bottom. Two wrecked airplanes about 100 yards apart in a debris field stretching over 500 feet in diameter. The Kootenai County Sheriff's Office has now located the remaining victims from Sunday's mid-air crash that occurred above Lake Coeur d'Alene. A final victim remains in one of the airplanes at the bottom of the lake, though. Thursday afternoon, we saw for ourselves as crews prepared to launch this barge and crane from the Lofts Bay boat launch not far from where the planes went down. Several factors are at play in terms of how long the work will take to get the planes out, but the sheriff's office says the team hopes to be wrapped up sometime this weekend. So our sonar team has been working nonstop since the planes went down. And the work hasn't been easy. Finding the wreckage and all eight victims has been a multi-day effort, and it's been a rush to bring closure to impacted families. The toll it takes on recovering that many deceased people in one shot is, is uh, uh, for the normal person would be devastating for for these police officers they're they're doing their job number one but you know that at the end of the day they're just human like everybody else for the sheriff's office this marks 10 fatalities on local waterways in just two weeks the weekend before the 4th of July, two people drowned on the Spokane River in unrelated accidents. Normally, the sheriff's office will respond to zero to three deaths on the water on an average summer, but not this year. Uh, for, you know, any, any summer, it's excessive, but for especially to have it this quick uh, is a lot of, a lot of um, turmoil in our department, too. That was Taylor Vito reporting. So here's what we know about the plane crash victims. Sean Fredrickson, his son and two stepchildren. They were in the seaplane along with the pilot Neil Lunt and one other person who's not yet been identified. Jay Colley and Kelly Krieger were in the Cessna and on their way to Lewiston. Well, yesterday we told you that Spokane Mayor Nadine Woodward vetoed a ban on the use of devices that emit high frequency sounds, more commonly known as mosquito devices. Well, there you can hear them right there. The ban was passed by city council with a four to three vote. The mosquito devices emit sounds that are only audible to young adults and children. Today we are learning the downtown Spokane partnership is against the mayor's veto. Well, the only activity they're discouraging, frankly, is uh, folks that are loitering at 10 or 11 o'clock at night and or illegally camping on private property. Uh, so they're not in any way impacting tourism or visitors. Otherwise, the businesses that are trying to run a business wouldn't want them. Mayor Woodward sits on the board of the Downtown Spokane Partnership. The City Council now has 30 days to consider responding to the veto with the possible override of five votes or more. All right, to weather now, there is a small chance of showers later on tonight, but things looking sunny and warm for the weekend. Chief Meteorologist Tom Sherry outside on the Outdoor Weather Center. And Tom, things looking pretty nice out there tonight. Oh, what a great, great late afternoon to be out here early evening. And we're going to be grilling up today at 6 o'clock. We'll fire up the grill. Who does meatball sandwiches on the grill? This guy does right here. We've got pork and beef meatballs here. We're going to grill them up. I'll tell you all about how to do this uh, coming up in the next uh, uh, weather segment. But first, let's get to the weather. Follow me over here, if you will, to the big blue screen. Then we'll go on that camera and we'll show you that you've got a few showers that are occurring across areas of northeastern Washington and into central Washington. We've just got a few clouds here locally, but still comfortable. We're at 78 degrees under partly to mostly cloudy skies right now. 
and you see the wind there. You can see the wind is out of the southwest right now at about 14 miles per hour. So here's a look at your day planner forecast. A beautiful evening to enjoy. Yes, we've got a chance of a few showers. Most of them, though, uh, to the west and north of us uh, in, here in the uh, inland northwest. We'll look for an overnight low of 55. Sunny skies expected on your Friday and a daytime high of 80. Look at Saturday's high temperature. 88 degrees, mostly sunny, increasing clouds on Sunday, windy, slight chance of showers and a daytime high of 76. I'll check your seven day forecast and also the best day to get out in your backyard and grill your barbecue forecast all coming up in a few minutes. Sounds good, Tom. We'll talk to you then. Thank you very much. Tracking the coronavirus today, North Idaho saw its single largest single day spike in cases. The Panhandle Health District reporting 97 new cases. No new deaths have been reported. More than 74% of coronavirus cases in North Idaho have been reported in people under the age of 50. Governor Brad Little announced today the state of Idaho will stay in phase four of reopening until the number of cases starts to go down. Meantime, in Spokane County, the Regional Health District is reporting almost 2,000 cases for the county since the start of the pandemic. And today, another 53 cases and no new deaths were reported. The Spokane County Health Officer says the county should have a positivity rate of about 2%, but right now the county is sitting at about 8%. All right, Whitney, Governor Jay Inslee says despite what President Donald Trump said this week, it'll ultimately be up to the states to decide how schools will reopen this fall. Yeah, so we have heard the president pressuring both state and local authorities to let kids go physically back into a classroom in the fall and to open schools. Uh, but of course, he's also been threatening to withhold federal funding for places that are not. All of this, as the Washington governor has said that local districts as well as colleges and universities are all working diligently on a plan to make sure they can reopen safely in the fall. And that he says that could involve a combination of in-person and remote learning. Inslee he says he plans to meet with the superintendent of public instruction here in Washington, Chris Reichdahl, next week to hear the latest plans. We have seen the White House again uh, threatening to attack our state. And uh, they've really, President has, has picked some uh, peculiar foes to want to have as, as your foes, and that is students and teachers and families who want the state of Washington. Governor Inslee said Washington will follow guidance from state and local health officials, as well as the CDC when it comes to reopening schools and the guidelines that will need to be followed. Now, just a few moments ago, Governor Inslee did go on uh, to tweet saying, I want schools to reopen this fall, and we are currently on pace to make that happen. But he says, I will not send our kids or educators back if it is unsafe to do so. Our number one priority from the beginning has been keeping Washingtonians safe. That has not changed. Now today, Idaho's Board of Education approved and released its plan for schools reopening in the fall. Now both the governor and the board made it very clear they want kids to be in the classroom, but that doesn't mean that this upcoming school year will not look different because it absolutely will. Regina Ahn is joining us now with the latest on those new guidelines. Hi, Regina. Hey there, Whitney. So yeah, the Board of Education released a 30 page document outlining best practices it wants school districts to follow. It addresses some key questions parents, kids and teachers are curious about. Questions like what if I'm not comfortable sending my child back to school? Well, these guidelines urge school districts to use a wide variety of strategies to ensure all students have access to consistent learning opportunities. The guidelines go on to explain that school districts need to be prepared to offer distance learning for all or a portion of their students at any time. So parents who would rather keep their kids at home should still have access to online or electronic classes. School districts will need to be prepared to offer distance learning for all or a portion of their students at any given time. So now what about face masks? Are they required at Idaho schools? There is a little bit of gray area here. Face coverings definitely are not mandated by the state. When there's minimal to moderate spread of the virus in a community, these guidelines encourage students and staff to cover their face with a cover or face shield. But a look, a local school district can decide on their own to make face coverings mandatory and schools must adhere to any local mask orders put in place by a city or county.
So what about screening kids and teachers for symptoms? When there is minimal to moderate spread of the virus, again, these guidelines do urge schools to screen staff and teachers every day when they arrive at school, inclu including a check for low-grade fever and other symptoms. Again, these guidelines aren't mandates, but des de designed as a framework to help local school districts make decisions about how to reopen their schools. Live here in the newsroom, Regina Ahn, Krem 2 News. All right, Regina, thank you very much. Thousands of college students are signing petitions to try and help international students who may lose their visas this fall if they go to online only classes. So there's a petition from UW, for example, that got 20,000 signatures just over the weekend. So these petitions were all basically created the after the Trump administration uh, made a move to revoke those student visas from those who are only going to be taking online classes. Now, there's a temporary exemption for international students who were taking online classes. It was created created during the coronavirus outbreak, but it will no longer be an exemption for fall of 2020. Now, ICE said that active students currently in the U.S. enrolled in such programs must depart the country or take other measures, such as transferring to a school with in-person instruction in order to remain in lawful status. The University of Washington a petition is now asking leaders to create some kind of class with minimal attendance requirements so that those international students can keep their visas. That petition says this, doing this would allow international students already burdened by the stress of studying in a foreign country and the perpetual uncertainty about their visa status due to the pandemic to stay in the U.S. without fear of deportation. And today that petition has surpassed 21,000 signatures. Also, W. USU students created a similar petition. That one has over 2,000 signatures. Here in Spokane, also, Gonzaga University released a statement in opposition of the Trump administration's plan, saying the decision to end the temporary exemption is both inappropriate and inhumane in light of this ongoing pandemic. Well, the Pac-12 is expected to announce all of its sports teams will play conference-only schedules in 2020. So Washington State University and UW, of course, members of the Pac-12 conference. Michigan, Washington in week one. Oregon, Ohio State in week two. Those are two of the biggest non-conference games that were originally scheduled during this upcoming season. Today, the Big Ten announced that all of its fall sports, including football, will also play conference-only schedules for 2020, eliminating each of its 14 football programs, three non-conference games. All right.